Good morning, guys, and welcome to Living Hope Church. It is great to see everyone this morning. I'm glad you guys have joined us online, that you've chosen to hang out with us at Living Hope Church Online. We know that there are a lot of really fantastic churches that are streaming this Easter, and the fact that you've chosen to hang out with us is just an amazing honor for us. So thank you. One thing that would really just be a huge blessing for us, if you are a guest here, we would love it if in the comments section You would introduce yourself, maybe drop a line, uh, just say hi to the other people. And then also, we'll have a link on there for a virtual guest card. And so what you can do is you can click on that link, and it will then shoot over to uh, our staff uh, your information so that we can contact you. You can submit prayer requests. We can get in touch with you and share with you all the cool stuff that Living Hope has been up to. So we would love it if you would do that. And, and uh, we just, again, want to thank you for joining us, joining us this morning. So we have been in a series uh, now for two weeks uh, called We Are Living Hope. And in that series, we're going through a bunch of really cool stories about people in the Bible whose lives have been changed by the power of God. And along with that, we've, a lot of those stories are coinciding with stories of people in this church, in Living Hope Church, whose lives have been changed by what God is doing here and by everything that God is, is doing within this body. So Um, But last week, we took a break from that, and we celebrated Palm Sunday, and we talked about the triumphant entry of Jesus and how Jesus' triumphant entry uh, causes us to be able to live a triumphant life as well. And then, of course, we had our Good Friday service on Friday, and Craig McDonald did a fantastic job uh, leading the sermon, and then uh, Gary did a great job on worship, so thank you to both of them. Uh, And I hope that you guys took some time that evening to just reflect on Jesus's crucifixion and what his crucifixion means to us and everything that it means to us. But the thing with uh, Good Friday is, is although it may be a sobering, somber time and a sobering, somber service, Easter always comes. And today, today is my absolute favorite Sunday of the year, and I wish that I could be with all of you. I wish that we could be together, but this is my favorite Sunday of the year, the Sunday that we get to celebrate that He is risen. It is Easter. But before today, getting into today's message, I would love it if you all would join me, take some time, let's pray together, thank God for everything that He's done for us, and then we'll get into the message today. Would you join me? Jesus, today we remember God, we remember and we thank you that you have risen from the grave, that while death and the enemy may have thought that they were victorious, they were defeated. I pray for everyone here this morning. I pray that they would have a new understanding of everything that you accomplished when you rose from the grave. Lord, let none of us leave this live feed the same, God. Let none of us leave our homes the same after this message. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me today, God. You would let my words be your words and my thoughts be your thoughts, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I have always loved Easter. I can remember as a kid waking up on Easter morning and my parents, uh, they would always set our Easter baskets out on the fireplace, right on the hearth there. And, uh, and, and so we would come out of our bedrooms and the first thing that we would see on Easter morning was this big Easter basket. And then uh, my parents, would, of course, would let us go through it and we'd go through it as a family. And it was just this amazing time where we would have way too much chocolate and I would be in a sugar craze for the rest of the day. And, and so naturally, when Renee and I got married and we began having children and celebrating all these fun things that you do with your kids, uh, our first real Easter, where the kids were able to uh, really understand what was going on and get it and, and, and do all the cool things, um, we prepared the Easter baskets that night. And I can remember waking up early that morning before the kids woke up with Renee. And it was our first Easter with kids who could actually get up and experience the surprise and the excitement. And all of a sudden, Renee started taking the Easter baskets that we'd prepared. And she put one in the oven, and then she put one behind the toilet. 
And I thought, what in the world are you doing, woman? And uh, what I didn't know is that when, as Renee was growing up, one of the things that her parents would do is they would hide the Easter baskets around the house and they would make the kids look for their Easter baskets, which was a super cool tradition. And so we compromised and naturally we do exactly what she did when uh, she was a kid, <laughs> which we love and we enjoy greatly. But um, we all have different Easter traditions, guys. We all have different uh, different things that we do to celebrate Easter, but the one thing that is constant, constant, the one thing that remains the same is God's goodness, is the goodness of Jesus during this season. The fact that Jesus rose from the grave, that he conquered death, hell, and the grave. The fact that in him and through him alone, there is resurrecting power for us. There's freedom for all who would call upon the name of Jesus. But let's face it, sometimes the reality is that sometimes it's kind of hard to believe and to understand everything that you read and hear. One of my favorite Easter stories out of the scriptures is the story of Thomas. Because I think that oftentimes I feel like many of us as followers of Christ can relate to Thomas in many ways. And I want, you, I want you all to know that just because I'm a pastor, just because I have the title pastor and, and because I lead this church, I don't ever want you to think that I'm a man who, who is without doubts in some way, shape, or form in my life. I have moments where, yeah, I, I doubt God's plan in my life. I have moments where I even doubt God's goodness sometimes. And some of you may be feeling that way right now with this whole coronavirus stuff that's going on. And I know that it can feel anxious and a lot of stress can be going on right now. I understand that. Some of you may be even feeling like you're doubting God's plan through all of this. In the past, I too have found myself in that spot. And guys, I want you to know today, it's okay. You may have wandered here on this live feed today, and maybe you don't know how you got here. You clicked on something and boom, you're here. <laughs> maybe somebody forced you to watch this today. Maybe, um, you know, you just are with your spouse or your family and, and you just, this is your Easter. Maybe you're doubting that God could love you this morning. Maybe you're doubting this morning that God could die for you that your sins could actually be forgiven. Maybe you're here this morning and you've heard it somewhere that you have to be just good enough in order for God to give you forgiveness, for God to love you. I want you to know this morning, it's okay to not have, have all the answers. It's okay to doubt. Just don't stay there. Today, my prayer is that you would leave this place more encouraged with more clarity on who Jesus is and his deep abiding love for you than you've ever had before. The story that I was talking about is one of my favorite stories. It's the story of Thomas. A lot of times he's known as Doubting Thomas. That's what is how he's referred to, which honestly is kind of stinks for him. Like you have one bad week and all of a sudden it sticks with you for the rest of eternity. You're known as Doubting Thomas and the guy just had a bad week, but you know, it is what it is. And so today we're going to find ourselves in the book of John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. Now, I want you to go ahead and I know most everybody has a Bible in your house. I want you to grab your Bible. Um, we're gonna be in the book of John. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So the fourth gospel, the fourth book in the New Testament. We're gonna be in chapter 20. And again, verses 24 through 29. And in our story, what's taken place now, of course, we celebrated Good Friday on Friday, and that is the day where Jesus, uh, we remember that Jesus died for our sins. When Easter comes, if you're not familiar with church, Easter is where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus' grave, <clears throat> Jesus has risen from the grave, and the bulk of the disciples have seen him. And, uh, but, but here's the deal. Mary and Martha were the first to see and talk to Jesus. And they gave the very first Easter message that was ever given where they proclaimed that Jesus had risen. But then there was Thomas. Thomas doubted Jesus. 
He doubted that Jesus could actually raise from the grave, that he could come back to life. And I think that oftentimes many of us can relate to Thomas. You know, a lot of people think, well, you know, this guy, me, he's a pastor, so he's got it all figured out. Um, He has no moments where he questions or doubts or has insecurities, but that couldn't be further from the truth. I think a lot of people doubt, and it's okay, again. But guys, do you blame Thomas? I mean, really, do you blame him? Think about it. We had just remembered Jesus' sacrifice on Good Friday. Craig McDonald reminded us of how Jesus' life trans- or his death transforms us. But before Good Friday, this, the disciples had literally given everything that they had in order to follow Jesus. Literally, they gave up their jobs, they gave up their livelihoods, they gave up their careers, they dropped everything. They left their families, their homes, their hometowns, all to follow this man, Jesus. And even though Jesus said to them multiple times, I'm going to die, and they're like, why are you doing this? He said, I'm doing this to prepare for my burial. And they're, I don't, they, maybe they didn't hear him, they didn't believe him, but he said multiple times, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But in their minds, Jesus had come to earth to set up a kingdom that was going to rock the Roman kingdom, the Roman rule of the land, and that Jesus was going to set up a throne and he was going to rule just like any other king or any other authority, and that Jesus was here to do that. But all of a sudden, Friday came, and Jesus is arrested. And he's put on trial. And he's beaten beyond recognition. And he's crucified and mocked and stabbed. And he breathes his last breath. And the disciples, could you imagine what Saturday was like? Could you imagine the flood of emotion? that came on Saturday for the disciples. This man that they had put all of their trust in, all of their, if they were playing a poker game, they, they, put, they went all in on Jesus. Maybe you're here today and in some way, shape or form, in some minute aspect, you can relate to that. Maybe you're here and just like the disciples, with all this stuff going on, you're wondering, how am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to keep a roof over my kid's head? How am I going to feed my family? How am I going to keep my business open? I have no idea what's next. I have no idea where to go. I'm, I'm lost. Guys, the beautiful thing about the story of Jesus is that Sunday comes. So that Sunday, that Sunday, Mary, Lazarus' sister, she's weeping outside the tomb of Jesus. And there she sees two angels. And in Luke's account, they look at her and she's weeping and, and they say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. And then she runs back to the disciples and this is where her story picks up. So this is John chapter 20, starting in verse 19. It says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Through, though the doors were locked, and Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Guys, Thomas had a hard time believing that Jesus was alive. And I think that all too often, we're just like him in many ways. There have been areas in my own life that I have struggled. Many of you know my story, and for those of you who don't, I shouldn't be here in front of you today. I, should, I shouldn't be serving God. In fact, I, I probably should be, in many ways, I should be incarcerated. When I became a follower of Jesus, it was September 7th, 2001. And for the next couple of years, over and over and over, people would tell me that Jesus loved me. But always I went back to the same doubts. How could Jesus love me? I see how he could love these people. They've lived their whole lives for him. They've gone to church their whole lives. They've served God their whole lives. I get that. But how could God love this person? I doubted God's love in my own life. Today, you and I can know that Jesus rose from the grave. But it hits a little closer to home when we think about this. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus rose from the grave for you. We read John 3.16. It's one of the most recognizable passages, passages of Scripture in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. I want to remind you today that that passage could and would read, For God so loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus, that if you would just believe in him, you would live forever. I want to remind you today that while we may doubt God's forgiveness in our life, he never doubts you. He's never forgotten you. He has never left you. He's never forsaken you, and he never will. God looked at you in the middle of your mess and in the middle of your filth, and he says, I want them in my family. God's love doesn't depend on your level of holiness. His love just is. Romans 5, 6, and 8 says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. One thing I, I, told, I have told our inmates in the jail ministry, even if there's only one, if, even if you were the only person on the earth, if you were it, Jesus would have still come to this earth. He would have still lived a perfect life. And he would have still given his life for you. Jesus' deep, deep love for you is unending. Don't doubt God's love for you. Along with God's love, oftentimes I find that a lot of people doubt God's forgiveness in their lives. Oftentimes when we choose to follow Jesus, it's the kindness of God that draws us in. The fact that he freely forgives our sin. But it's, it's this weird dichotomy that takes place because many people accept the free forgiveness of Jesus and then they believe all of a sudden that in order to keep that forgiveness of Jesus, they have to be perfect 24-7. And if they're not perfect, then all of a sudden that forgiveness is stripped from them. 
I went through this. I went through a season in my life where I thought if I didn't keep all the rules and keep all the, the, do all the right things and say all the right words and pray all the right prayers, then God's forgiveness would be stripped from me. God's requirement for you is not that you're perfect, church. It's that you surrender. I meet with people from time to time and, and, and they believe that they've sinned too far for God to forgive them. Today, if you're doubting God's forgiveness in your life because you're not perfect, you need to know that that is exactly why Jesus came for you because you're not perfect. He rose from the grave. He died and rose from the grave because you're not perfect. In fact, the only requirement for being a follower of Jesus is that you are willing to admit that you're not perfect. Psalm 103, 10 through 12 says this, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear or respect him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Do you have any idea how far the east is from the west? And Jesus displayed it perfectly on the cross when he stretched out his arms for the sins of the world. They never touch. When we doubt God's forgiveness in our life, or we, oftentimes we doubt God's forgiveness in our life, but it was Jesus' death and resurrection that speaks of his deep, deep love for us and his unending forgiveness for anyone who would call on his name. God hasn't just forgiven your past sins. He's forgiven the sins today, tomorrow, and forever. Easter, Jesus, Jesus is rising from the grave, not only shows us of the deep love that God has for us, but also the, unfor the unending forgiveness that God has for us in our life. But it also shows us that God has a purpose for us. Remember the disciples. Remember that they went, from, uh, they went from their complete world wrapped around who Jesus was. But then Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross. His side was pierced. They removed him. They put him in the tomb. They had lost all hope for the future. They had no idea what they were going to do. They couldn't see past their pain. Maybe you're here today and you stumbled on this message and you find yourself in that place with no hope. You can't see past your current circumstances. You can't see past your current fear and anxiety. Not knowing that Jesus loves you, that he, he died for you. Maybe you came into this feed this morning not understanding that Jesus died and rose again, not just for your eternity, but your, for your today. A few years ago, I found myself in a similar spot. I had allowed deep sin into my own life. I felt unworthy of the love and the forgiveness that Jesus died to offer me. And I couldn't see past that. I couldn't believe that God had a plan and a purpose for my life. Today, I want to remind you of something this morning. Not only does God have a deep, unending love for you, not only does he have a deep, unending forgiveness for you, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, Craig MacDonald used this exact scripture, says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Guys, Jesus rose from the grave so that you could have the, the abundant life that God intended for you to have. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I've, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. God doesn't want you to stay where you're at, guys. He wants you to grow. He wants you to mature. He wants you to see him in every season of your life. But too often we can't get past our own hurt, our own pain, our own sinfulness, our own doubt. And because of that, we stay where we are and we forget this.
dude. No way. I told you. You're not going to believe what just happened. Long ago, this is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. There is something that you need to know this Easter. Jesus is risen and he is calling you out of death and into the newness of life that he has for you. That means that there is a hope, there is hope for the hopeless, that there is joy for the mourning, there is healing for the broken. If you remember the story of Lazarus, the man that Jesus raised from the dead, Jesus met Lazarus in the middle of his death. He didn't make Lazarus clean up before coming to him. The reality was is he couldn't, and Jesus knew that. But Jesus called him to life. But it was up to Lazarus to step out of the tomb and into the light of life. Today, my challenge to you, if you don't know Jesus, if you've been living your life your own way for so long, stop. Surrender your life to Jesus. Step into the new life that God has for you. All you have to do is call upon the name of Jesus. If you're here today and you know Jesus, but you have not been living your life for him, it's time for you to step out of the tomb. It's time for you to live the life that God has called you to live. Living Hope Church, if you're here under the sound of my voice this morning, and you're stuck in the life that you don't want, Jesus is calling you into that new life. Jesus' story didn't end in the grave, and neither does yours. Don't doubt his love for you. Don't doubt his forgiveness for you. And don't doubt his purpose for your life. It's all because Jesus rose from the grave. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that you have risen, that in you and through you, we can all be free. We know that you love us, that you've forgiven us, that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. And Lord, for those who do not know you that are here today, I pray that they would not leave this live feed without knowing you. Help us to see that it is finished and that true life is found in you. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, remember, he is risen and he's calling you to step into the newness of life. Happy Easter. Thank you.